Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome to the City of Casey Council meeting on Tuesday the 6th of October. I'd like to welcome all of the community who are watching live stream and note that in line with the current restrictions issued by the Victorian Government on public gatherings due to COVID-19, the public gallery for this meeting is closed and the meeting is being held virtually and publicly live streamed in keeping with the good practice guidelines issued by Local Government Victoria. Uh, this afternoon we have a number of reports, 11 officer reports and one officer report to be considered in the closed council meeting. I'll start with the statement of acknowledgement. The City of Casey proudly acknowledges the traditional owners, Casey's Aboriginal communities and their rich culture and pays respect to their elders past, present and future. We acknowledge Aboriginal people as Australia's first peoples and as the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we work and live. The diversity statement. The city of Casey is home to a remarkable diversity of cultures, languages, faiths, identities, landscapes and stories. From our first Australians to our most recent arrivals and every wave in between, the city of Casey welcomes and represents all community members and their respective ambitions to live healthy, rewarding and happy lives. These intersecting and overlapping community stories form Casey's co collective identity and contribute to its evolving rich history. We recognise this diversity as our strength and we aim to share, nurture and celebrate it. I now move on to item two, the confirmation of minutes. Is there a mover for the minutes? Yes, and I, I welcome, I do apologise, I do welcome uh, those of us in the meeting this afternoon, myself being Nolene Duff, the Chair of the Panel of Administrators, Miguel Belmar, who just had his hand up there, and Cameron Boardman, welcome. And also welcome to Mr Glenn Patterson, our Chief Executive Officer, and our executive team, who I know are online and assisting us this afternoon, are both Jacinta and Jordan. So thank you and my apologies for that oversight. So Mr Belmar, you were moving the minutes. That's the minutes of the 15th of September. And That's I will good. second those minutes as Mr Boardman was an apology for that meeting. So we uh, vote on the carriage of those minutes. Thank you. Yes. Declaration of interests. Um, I've considered my obligations under the Local Government Act with respect to the matters before us this afternoon and I invite my fellow administrators and any officers present to declare any conflicts of interest they wish to declare. Uh, yes, uh, through the Chair, um, I've considered uh, my uh, potential conflicts and I have made written declaration to the CEO in accordance with section 78B and section 79 of the Local Government Act that I uh, believe I have a indirect conflict of interest or have a potential indirect conflict of interest with respect to item 5.8 in today's agenda. Thank you, Mr. Belmar. We will note that when we come to the item and you will excuse yourself for that particular item. I will. Thank you. Move on to public question time and we have six public questions this afternoon and I'll, I'll work through them uh, one by one. The first question is from Dat Nguyen and it's with respect to rates relief. And the question is, considering Casey rates are on the higher end compared to other councils, is there any discussion around reducing rates to relieve financial burden on residents? The City of Monash have provided 10% reduction to their rates due to financial stress caused by COVID-19. I would expect our council would be having similar discussion around rate reduction. Um, uh, thank you, Mr Nguyen, for the question. And uh, I think we've noted in prior council meetings our appreciation and concern for the increasing financial stress that uh, residents in our community are experiencing with respect to the impact of COVID-19. And uh, council has implemented a number of specific strategies in response to those concerns. Uh, firstly, a freeze on interest on outstanding rates to the 31st of December 2020, um, and also a decision to not pursue legal action on outstanding rates uh, before 
March 2021. So it's important that we convey that we do understand those concerns. We understand that uh, we have many people in this community that have uh, experienced the loss of jobs, loss of income and other matters associated with the pandemic. And we are certainly continuing to monitor the situation. We've had literally an update today on the impact of COVID-19 on our organisation and on this community. And uh, we will continue to do that and review that. But I, I will say, and we have said this in previous meetings, that um, should anybody be experiencing hardship, they need to make contact with us, uh, make contact with uh, the organisation and the staff from the finance area will uh, respond to your request uh, for consideration of relief relating to rates. Uh, we do, we have reviewed a financial hardship policy very recently and they are armed with that information and the policy framework that allows them to consider consider those requests. So the important thing is uh, to make contact with us and make those requests. So uh, provide that information. And thank you, Mr Nguyen, for your question. Question two is from Norma Kayser. And uh, it's quite a lengthy introduction to this question. So I'm not going to read the whole question, but it's with respect to activities at Salandra Community Hub, which is a city of Casey community facility. And uh, the background is uh, quite detailed and extensive as to why council are publicising Zumba classes at the Salandra Community Hub. Uh, and the question is, why is the City of Casey supporting, funding, encouraging and advertising Zumba classes while it refuses to support in any form food relief programs counselling services, youth and children's services, men's and women's support services and many other services that faith-based groups offer. So the subject is the exclusion of faith-based groups. I think we have addressed this question on a number of occasions um, and uh, I have asked for officers to uh, convey that uh, back to the uh, submitter of the question, um, but also to note that we do have quite extensive information on our website and I've had another look at it again today, uh, having reviewed this question. And the range of support services and agencies that are offering support to members of our community do include a number of faith-based groups. So I do confirm that there is no uh, intended exclusion of any faith-based groups in providing that. Uh, the important thing is that the council website is a council website and the Zumba classes at the Salandra Community Harbour Council uh, provided services. So thank you for that question. Question three and question four are both from Scott Hamilton. The first question from Mr. Scott Hamilton is the Capital Works Program, which is an item on our agenda this afternoon. And the question is, Council's Capital Works policy states that projects are evaluated for their whole of life costs to determine the effective value of the works on a benchmarked basis. Council's 2021 budget lists seven key projects that account for 30% of the total works program by cost. What are the whole of life costs and relevant cost ben benchmarks for each of these key projects? Um, Mr. Hamilton, thank you for that. I'm not going to go through each of those uh, items uh, in this format this afternoon. I certainly encourage you to make contact directly with council officers and that's our manager city and asset planning. Uh, but I will provide just a brief overview that council does evaluate capital projects using seven principles, including whole of life costs for existing and new assets. And so when uh, a project is being evaluated before it even comes to council for consideration for funding as part of our annual budget cycle, the cost assessment relates to the whole process of procurement, design and construction, the ongoing operations, should it be a facility that in future will be staffed and will need to be maintained for the whole of its life and the asset life cycle management. So that includes any renewals, upgrades, extensions, um, expansion includes depreciation and eventually uh, the 
uh, when the uh, project is at the end of its life, the disposal of that project. So for new projects, whole of life costs are also benchmarked against similar projects previously delivered by council. And clearly there is also a procurement policy, which is not only a requirement of the state government, but is also adopted specifically by council uh, that uh, requires us to tender projects within different financial tranches. So uh, it is uh, a very sophisticated process that council goes through and uh, I certainly encourage you for more detail to make contact directly with our management team. And Mr Scott Hamilton, your further question uh, relates to contacting the administrators and council meeting dates for 2021. And I thank you for the question because um, it has prompted me to have a look at this material on our website, which I, I will admit I, I haven't looked at for a little while. And I have this afternoon once again asked um, our communications team to review the content of this. So I do thank you for prompting, prompting us to do that. It was timely and uh, I welcome your input. So your question specifically was, administrators Belmar and Boardman commenced their roles in May 2020. Four months on, Council's web start, website still states more information on contacting and engaging with administrators will be made available in the coming days. As such, public question time appears to be the only method of direct contact available to residents, albeit with restrictions of two questions per fortnightly meeting. With the proposed move to monthly meetings, will the administrators raise the limit on public questions to four per meeting to avoid further disenfranchising residents? Um, in March of this year, or in, in just after I started as administrator, uh, that process was created as a means to provide an avenue directly to the administrators and provide feedback. So the, the avenue is not just simply public question time. The Ask the Administrators is an opportunity um, to provide that direct contact. But I do emphasise that the administrators are not uh, involved in the day-to-day -day delivery of services and programs. We have a strategic and policy role and uh, we have a, a very capable, competent and extensive team of staff that deliver services within the council. So uh, the very first and best place for people to get the quickest response is to ring through to council's customer service area. We certainly are very welcoming of input as a panel of administrators and uh, I invite you to, to use those opportunities to ask questions at council and to also ask the administrator. And I do, I do say thank you to you for raising uh, the, the um, I guess, uh, the, the uh, issues that uh, are not clear in that communication and that's being updated. I also point you to uh, the Shape Your City process and I'll speak about that a little bit shortly. And that's another opportunity to provide input and to think about the future of the city. Question five is from Mr. Bruce Wood and it's with respect to the proposed Rosemore Gallery development at 193 209 King Road, Harkaway. And the question is, will the City of Casey Council uphold the amenity and facilitate the requirements of its own planning scheme for the Green Wedge Zone A in Harkaway? For the purpose of these questions, amenity means all the features that the existing environment embraces. This includes pleasantness, character, and inherent psychological or social benefits that the Green Wedge embraces. An amenity for the purpose of this question does not include commercial development in the Green Wedge Zone. Mr Wood also has raised a further question, and that's question six, that in respect of the proposed Rosemore Gallery development that is opposed by the Harkaway residents and is not a permitted use under the Casey Planning Scheme, will Casey Council support the Harkaway residents and its own planning scheme and make a submission to the Minister for Planning opposing the proposed development? So I'll respond to those two questions and alert Mr Wood to the, uh, this is a matter that will be considered by council at its next meeting on the 20th of October. And that will be a report which I have not yet seen, which the uh, panel of administrators have not yet been briefed on, which relates to our submission, City of Casey's submission to the advisory committee that has been established by the Minister for Planning to consider this application. 
And uh, that process is one that uh, council is a stakeholder in that process. So we will participate in the advisory committee process that has been established by the Minister for Planning. And that has been established by the Minister to look at the suitability of the proposal and any draft controls. So council at the moment, council officers are reviewing the exhibited plans and documents and preparing that submission. And uh, we certainly encourage anybody that has an interest in this project and re adjacent residents have been advised directly by the department, um, the planning panels, Victoria, who are running the process on behalf of the minister, provide input to that advisory committee. And that can be accessed uh, on the minister for the Minister's website for this purpose, which is www.planning.vic.gov.au. So that's www.planning.vic.gov.au and that uh, proposed gallery development. It's amendment um, C273, uh, 193 209 King Road, Harkaway is, is actually on that website and you can access those documents. So thank you, Mr Wood, once again for those questions. And before we move on to the council agenda, I do just want to uh, make mention of the Shape Your City process. And uh, I invite those of you watching that uh, you have a look at the council website. Uh, the home page provides a range of links about Shape Your City and Shape Your City is our council planning process. So it is the, the important piece of planning work that we do over the next four years as part of our job as administrators to ensure that we are taking into account the needs of the community in future planning, both in terms of service delivery, infrastructure, parks and gardens, services and facilities, community services, uh, etc. And I do commend the, the work of the officers. It's an extensive package of opportunities that are available on the council website. And I'll just mention a few of them, but there's a survey that takes about 10 minutes and uh, the good thing is there's a prize for five participants of that survey, but that will uh, give some really good input and feedback to us uh, in the future process. That survey is also available and translated into a number of community languages. So if there are people in the community that you know would benefit from that, you can assist them to access that um, on the website as well. Uh, one of the great opportunities that uh, has been provided is that you can host a conversation. If you're a member of a community group, a club or a, a group in the community, you can actually facilitate a discussion and there's an extensive toolkit, which is really excellent. Uh, I encourage you to have a look at that, uh, that allows you to be the leader of that discussion within your community and provide us with some comprehensive feedback. And we'd love to hear that. There are also a number of virtual events uh, and different dates that are on the website over the next month. And also you can become a Shape Your City Ambassador. So have a look at those elements on our website and uh, we look forward to having your input and feedback. As I say, that is a pivotal document that the council will be developing over the coming months. So thank you. I now move on to item five, which is officer reports. And the first item this afternoon is item 5.1, which is the 2019-20 Capital Works Program carryover and 2021 Capital Works Program year-to-date budget variations. Do I have a move for that report? Yes, I'll move Thank that. Thank you, Mr. Belmar. And a seconder, Mr. Boardman. Mr. Belmar, I invite you to speak to the report. Yes, um, this um, recommendation is that Council approve $68.4 million of carryover from the 2019-20 into the 2021 budget for the Capital Works Program as per the attachment. And secondly, the Council approve the sum set out there of $158,219 of budget variations to the 2021 Capital Works Program. Now, in many respects, this is a a procedural policy in that there has been the budgetary work undertaken in the past to ensure that the funds are available for this work to occur. Um, as the briefing paper informed me, um, there are a number of reasons why the delivery of the Capital Works program uh, could not all occur during um, the 
budget year and uh, a number of the reasons uh, uh, include the size of the program, its complexity and the impact of COVID. I'm satisfied in reviewing the documents that it's appropriate that the carryover occur and I'm also satisfied that the amount that is attributed to budget variations is an appropriate amount given um, the size of the capital works budget and note that um, it's a modest sum when compared to the size of the um, of the uh, works program and for those reasons I commend the motion. Thank you Mr Bellman. Mr Boardman. Thank you Chair. Um, just very briefly I think um, as Mr Belbarn's pointed out, we have um, a responsibility for efficacy and optimization of council expenditure and to ensure that any um, variations or, or, or any unforeseen circumstances are adapted and any adjustments are made uh, timely and transparently. That's exactly what we are doing in this circumstance. I would expect and certainly the advice is consistent with this that um, this will not be the first of such papers that will come to our attention. There will be further variations and carryovers in uh, the foreseeable future and in subsequent financial is purely because of the unknown and the difficult environment that uh, we are currently operating on. Uh, but to ensure that we are meeting our community's expectations um, by being completely transparent around this and making those necessary adjustments and having a value attribution as a foundation of our decision making, these uh, reports and approaches are, are absolutely essential. So I do um, commend uh, the report uh, and uh, please to second it. Thank you, Mr. Boardman. And I'll put the motion to the vote. All in favour? Carried. Item 5.2, Council Delegate Appointments. Do I have a mover? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Boardman. Seconder, Mr. Belmar. Mr. Boardman. Uh, we, as a panel, have, have considered um, a number of the appointments that um, past councillors and council officers themselves have um, made um, in relation to a number of local and other entities. We've uh, concluded this review that's been um, conducted over a number of months now uh, to look at where we can um, add the greatest amount of value and contribution to those such entities and also where the community will get um, the maximum exposure and consistency in communications and engagement with the council itself. Um, there is a number of changes that we're making and uh, in today we are appointing um, ourselves to, uh, to six or five, I should say, particular entities. Um, but I do so on the basis of um, ensuring the community that where councillors were either board members or representatives on such entities in the past, that if there has been a supplementation uh, uh, of such individuals with council officers, that the level of engagement will in no way be different or diminish. In fact, I, I, would, I would say that there'll be significant improvement for some of the reasons that um, the chair outlined in her response to um, the query from Mr. Hamilton regarding contact with administrators and um, utilising case conversations and other communication mechanisms. Uh, but we are dealing with, um, as I said, five specific appointments, the Auden Risk Committee, the Casey Cardinia Foundation, the Casey Cardinia Library Corporation, the Municipal Association of Victoria and the Western Port Biosphere Foundation and the appointments are, are public as per the report. Um, I do note from a personal perspective that I um, am very excited and pleased to be appointed as the Council Representative to the Audit and Risk Committee. In doing so, I do want to acknowledge the service of Mr Robert Bennett and Mr Vince Philpott, um, who have decided to retire from that committee, who have, uh, Mr Bennett has been the chair of the Audit and Risk Committee for a number of years and uh, Mr Philpott likewise has served on the committee as an independent member for a number of years and I'd like to put on the record on behalf of all um, everyone, everyone at Casey, our appreciation to Mr Bennett and to Mr Philpott and also our ongoing appreciation to Mr Simon Ma um, uh, Marnie who will continue to serve on the committee. We have um, commenced an exercise to look at uh, potential replacements and we want to position this as an attractive appointment for people who want to serve in these independent review type mechanisms, but also to set a, a benchmark and be an exemplar amongst local government entities that we are going to be certainly looking at a diversification of candidates, um, particularly looking at uh, diversity of, of gender equity and, and difference of experience, but to have a fresh approach on how we can get a, a broader skill set, broader experience to really help us with our 
um, roles as administrator and to, to improve the performance of the council overall. Um, so it's a, a challenge that I certainly am very much looking forward to, looking forward to working with a new chair and a new independent member and Mr. Mr. Marnie and um, everyone from the council itself who um, is contributing to what is an essential part of council administration and of course uh, statutory required under the Local Government Act provisions. Um, and I do wish uh, my, my co-administrators, Mr. Belmar and um, staff, on their respective appointments uh, with the um, uh, committees and, uh, and boards that have been identified in the report. Um, and with those comments, um, Chair, I'm, I'm pleased to move the Council report as stated. Thank you. Mr. Belmar. Uh, I don't have uh, too much to add to Mr. Boardman's comments other than to say that uh, there will be no less representation from Council and Council's interests on boards and that a careful exercise has been undertaking in identifying the most appropriate way of using Council's uh, uh, Council's assets and Council's uh, staff to uh, best serve the interests of Council and for that reason I second the motion. Thank you, Mr. Belmar. I'll put the motion to the vote. All in favour? Carried. Item 5.3, the Strategic Risk Register. Do I have someone to move the recommendation? Mr. Belmar yes. moved and Mr. Boardman second. Would you like to speak to the motion, Mr. Belmar? Yes, I'll speak. Uh, no briefly to this motion. Um, the Strategic Risk Register is a document that's prepared uh, for Council. Um, what it does is that it identifies the risks um, that Council faces in offering its services. Uh, it's an important document um, to undertake because it ensures that Council uh, is properly informed of potential risks in its offerings. Um, it's also an important document because apart from identifying a risk, um, it also provides measures to identify ways that a risk can be mitigated. And so that is really the key. It's not enough to simply identify a risk. You need to be able in proper risk management to find a, a mitigation tool. And this document ensures that council is complying with um, its duty to ensure that at all times it's acted in a, in a way um, that properly pr protects the interest of Council. And for those reasons, um, I commend the motion. Thank you, Mr. Belmar. Mr. Boardman? Just very briefly to um, echo Mr. Belmar's sentiments that uh, this is a live document. Uh, the improvements that we have made in our governance and administration of our, our risks um, and um, our enterprise risk frameworks um, ensures that there will be a, a significant uh, uh, improvement in, in ensuring that there is contemporary frameworks applied to our, our risks and also the management of the register accordingly. Um, it is important to note that we are very much compliant with uh, 30,000 ISO guidelines and standards and also the Victorian Government Risk Management Framework. Um, but from Northern Risk Committee and an ongoing oversight role. Uh, this is one of the most important documents that Council it has. Uh, we do invite significant community participation and feedback into any of the risks we've identified and how we can improve our management accordingly. Um, but as I said, it is a continuous improvement environment that we are applying in this regard and uh, one that uh, will be constantly monitored and updated and improved um, to ensure that we are meeting all of our obligations to create a safe workplace and deliver services to the community as effectively and as safely as possible. Thank you, Mr. Boardman. Okay, I'll put that motion to the vote. All in favour? Carried unanimously. Council meeting dates for 2021. Do I have a mover? Mr. Boardman? Seconded, Mr. Belmar. Mr. Boardman? Thank you, Chair. It, it follows uh, the answer that you gave to Mr. Scott Hamilton's question um, in regards to access to ourselves and uh, and our overall engagement with the community. And um, and and whilst your answer was comprehensive, and and I certainly touched on this uh, when we were talking about uh, the delegate appointments to various entities. 
Um, it is something that ourselves as administrator has uh, given significant attention to, to try and find the right balance between efficiency in uh, not overburdening council offices on expectations around administrative requirements, um, and also that critical linkage to allow the community to engage with us, to ask questions, to put forward feedback, to ensure that, that all matters of of urgency and attention and aspects that need to be considered uh, are coming to, uh, to, to through the right channels. Um, what the community is probably not visible about is, is, is the level of detail and work and engagement that happens behind the scenes. I think it's important to, to note in this regard that uh, we have a, a very formal way of dealing with all matters. We, we meet every Tuesday with a very comprehensive forward set agenda with a significant amount of, of not just evaluation consideration on council reports before they come to the council itself, but also strategic and other emerging issues that uh, that require ongoing consideration. And a big part of that, in addition to, to the formal briefings, is the community engagement and the feedback that uh, the council office prepare and provide to us. So. Whilst this on the surface looks like that there is a listening of the opportunities for the community to meet with us in, in a council environment to ask us questions, that's absolutely not the case because of, of improvements to technologies, improvements to engagement. We've recently adopted our community engagement strategy and how we now interact and, and, and filter, um, look for trends, look for, for issues that need some, some additional attention and how we can um, ensure that we are representing those views accordingly. Um, but there is also this question of efficiency and and we have as a panel looked at the efficiency from the perspective that that we are probably more efficient and to give greater opportunity to the community by having monthly council meetings and we proposed the third Tuesday per month at 4 p.m. which is now the established um, um, operating time. Um, but that in no way dilutes what will happen again leading up to those council meetings. So the improvements that we've made in, in governance and, and, and compliance and certainly what we're doing with, with Ordinary Risk and with other community engagement mechanisms, our community engagement strategy overall and, and the council outreach program as a whole, um, there is uh, going to be significant improvement and ongoing improvement to ensure that community views are represented accordingly. Um, so this is, this is a, a further step in improving the efficiency and the engagement and outreach from a Casey perspective, and also improving the efficiency and operating rhythm of the council as a whole. So whilst um, I can appreciate that some members of the community do have some concerns um, on the surface, I do give a reassurance quite strongly that that is not the case. This is a very positive step to ensure that we are operating and meeting those expectations accordingly, but equally we're getting the right balance between not overburdening their offices, ensuring the community have got the right me mechanisms to communicate with us and that there is ample opportunity for further engagement opportunities in the future. I'm pleased to um, to move the proposal as, uh, as stated. Thank you, Mr Boardman. Mr Belmar, did you have any comments as seconder? Uh, look, I think Mr Boardman has, I echo his comments. Um, I want to confirm for the community that I, I in adopting um, this meeting schedule, I see that there will be no lessening the opportunity for the community to engage with the administrators. As Mr Boardman has uh, set out, um, we are in, actively engaged uh, continuously in communicating with the council and its officers and have formal meetings that ensure we are kept up to date, apart from using technology to ensure we are able to be contacted at all times. Um, the formal council meeting is only one of the ways in which um, we communicate uh, with the community. Um, it, it is an, it, the, an important way um, and um, there is there will be no reduction in the opportunities for communication. So for all those reasons, I commend the motion. Thank you, Mr. Belmar, and I'll put that motion to the vote. All in favour? Carried. Item 5.5, .5, Land Acquisition 85, Hardys Road, Clyde North. Do I have a mover for the recommendation? Yes, I'll move that. Thank you, Mr. Belmar. Seconder, Mr. Boardman. And Mr. Belmar, would you like to speak to the motion? Yes. Um, in moving this motion, I'm mindful that um, as it's should be visible on the screen that a process has been undertaken um, already by council to acquire a small parcel of land which is necessary to uh, fulfill a future requirement for a um, for a four lane arterial road um, servicing both existing and future residential developments 
in the Hardings Road area. Um, it's appropriate that this sort of work continue to occur and that it occur in a timely manner to ensure that land is available um, to meet Council's requirements for uh, road building. Um, and for those reasons, I commend the motion and I also um, am, am mindful of um, encouraging and um, and grateful for the continuous work that council officers do to ensure a timely delivery of important services such as these roads and the, that they are delivered at a time when they are required and that um, the release of land and that the uh, amenity for new communities in new estates is not in any way diminished by a failure to ensure delivery, delivery of roads in a timely manner. And so for those reasons, I commend the motion. Thank you, Mr. Belmar. Mr. Borgman, did you have anything to add? No, I fully echo Mr. Belmar's comments and equally offer uh, my um, commendation to, uh, to council officers for their timely response. Thank you. I'll put that motion to the vote. All in favour? Carried. Thank you. So we move on to item 5.6, and that is planning application for 434 442 Belgrave Hallam Road, Narry Warren North. Do I have a mover for the recommendation? Thank you, Mr. Boardman, and a seconder, Mr. Belmar. Mr. Boardman, would you like to speak to the motion? Thank you, Chair. I, I, I may take some time to um, go into a little bit of detail regarding Certainly. this particular um, item, considering the volume of objections that the, the Council has received. Um, and I start by, by noting that um, there, there might be a slight typo in the recommendations. There's actually three recommendations, not five, um, as uh, as might appear in the public documents. Um, recommendation one, the council issues a notice decision to grant a planning permit. Two, that any objectors be notified of council decision. Three, that the Department of Transport, Melbourne Water Transport Victoria and the Country Fire Authority be notified of council decisions. So it's just a small typo, but I think just to remove confusion that there are the three recommendations. Um, I want to go back to December 2015, um, where uh, previous council um, received an application for a school to be built at uh, premises known as 20 Beckett Street in Narry Warren North, uh, Beckett Road, I should say, Narry Warren North. Um, there was 10 objections to that particular project. Um, and the council on the 8th of December approved that permit um, and the permit was granted in early 2016 and construction commenced. It is a secondary college. It is a faith-based secondary this college that has um, 370 students and 20 staff. Um, and this is important because this particular school immediately abuts the parcel of land of which council has received an application to develop. Um, it's exactly the same planning scheme, exactly the same planning zone, and it is it is in the in the green wedge as a number of the objectors have highlighted. Um, but it is a school that has um, gone through a proper council planning process and consideration. Uh, almost five years ago, there was, as I said, only ten objections, and council quite rightly applying the planning regulations appropriately at that time, granted the permit that it's constructed and it continues to operate today. Um, and this is an important precedent because what the council is dealing with is an almost identical application. With one distinction is that it is not a secondary school that is um, being uh, applied for, it is a primary school. And going to my comments around the amount of engagement and consideration ourselves as an administrator and the council office as, as a whole apply when we're making such decisions. This is an example of where there has been extensive and comprehensive evaluation and consideration of the issue. We note that the public ad ad advertising for this particular issue commenced in March of this year uh, and we've had 160 objections which is obviously a significant increase on the amount of objections for almost an identical application five years ago. We also noticed that a number of those objections are, are very much based and have valid reasons around the traffic management, around the removal and the impact on flora and fauna, around the school need, around the location within the green wedge, the request for screening, the safety with dams located on site, bushfire safety, traffic safety, et cetera, et cetera. 
And all objections, all of the issues that have been um, raised have been thoroughly considered by council officers and equally thoroughly considered by ourselves. I note that a number of those objections have been uh, dealing with the faith based element of this particular uh, application. And I have to from the outset say that, that that is absolutely nothing irrelevant. The decision in 2015, as I said, was a faith based school, a secondary college. And as it was determined then that that is not a consideration for determining this partic that particular planning permit. And so it is now the case that with this particular planning permit that that equally is not a determination for making this decision. Um, and for that reason, we have to be very conscious that the only application that we can as administrators apply when judging and assessing the merits of this particular application and any application for that matter is on fairness, on equity and any other process that the planning regulations, the planning zone and any state overlays and other conditions apply. And that is exactly what we have done. And my fellow administrators will acknowledge that how comprehensive this particular process has been. And in doing so, it is important to note that we have as a condition to this to granting this this particular planning permit, we have imposed 53 conditions, which is stipulated on attachment 5.6.1. And those attachments, those conditions relate to aspects of the master plan development around stage development plans and ensuring that there is uh, approvals at each phase of, of the development, that the layout is not altered, that there is considerations to noise controls, to general amenity, there is aspects to improve security, building works and other fixtures and plan of equipment. But importantly, and I'd like to bring the community's attention to, is conditions 12 and conditions 13 around the hours of operation and the operational management. And these are critical because we are, if we do pass this resolution or recommendation tonight, we are granting a planning permit for a primary school. And it is critical in doing so that, that we are only granting a permit for a primary school. So any other facilities that may be incorporated as part of the master plan or any other development on this particular site, we are putting a prohibition in the conditions and making it absolutely uh, a stipulation that they must only be used exclusively relating for what normal and reasonable use of the primary school would be and they are not available for any external public use without the prior written consent of the responsible authority including ourselves. So any other community or recreational or other uh, other facilities that would exist on this particular site, they cannot be used for any other purpose except for the primary school, which is absolutely stipulated in the conditions that I've, I've referenced. And equally, the hours of operations are quite clear that the hours of operation, apart from public holidays from Monday to Friday, will be 8 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. And on Saturday, there'll be no operation. On Sunday and public holidays, there will be no operations. But there's also been very significant consideration from a number of the objectors around the traffic management, around the amenity, around the noise controls, around other aspects of, uh, of, of tree management and protection. And I note in the report, and this has been consistent with a number of the briefings and considerations that we've had around the transport management aspects, that there will be a transport management master plan and, and there will be a, an operational plan that will go with that that Vic Roads and the Department of Transport are supporting the application with conditions that Melbourne Water has no objections, that Transport for Victoria has no objections, and equal in relation to bushfire management and some of the ongoing flora and fauna management issues that the Country Fire Authority equally has no objections. But I go back to one of my opening comments if I could share that as administrators, we can only determine these decisions based upon planning laws and the regulations and all of the considerations of the schemes that are presented to us. And we note that we have received some last minute objections in relation to the use of such facilities as it relates to the Green Wedge. And in doing so, I need to again go back to the decision that Council made in 2015 on the immediately adjacent site, that schools, places of worship and other similar facilities are permissible developments in the Green Wedge. And that is consistent with the precedent that was established in December 2015 on um, the approval to develop the Harkaway Hills College, which is also, as I say, a faith-based school. So with those comments, Chair, is that the report 
has comprehensively analysed the plans, the considerations, all of the overlays, the planning zones, the efficacy of, of the development itself. And as administrators, we have done exactly the same thing. There is nothing in any of the information that's been presented to me that will in any way suggest that, that this permit cannot be approved. It is a permissible use. The conditions, the 53 conditions that have been stipulated in attachment 5.61 go to the core of a number of the objections and I think quite quite significantly address and manage those objections. And any other issues that have been raised, uh, particularly as it relates to the faith elements of this particular development, I again say quite clearly that they are irrelevant. So with those comments, I do need to place on the record that uh, I agree with the recommendations from council officers. There is uh, no reason for me to be further considering any of the objections. I think that they have been adequately managed through this process. There has been undoubtedly significant opportunities for community consultation and for engagement with objectors. And I'm satisfied that that is as comprehensive as the circumstances allow. And in conclusion, I just want to say that uh, there is, of course, an opportunity for any objector or any proponent for that matter to seek further review of such uh, a decision of council through the appropriate channels um, and those avenues exist to, to anyone at any time. Um, and whilst in, in 2015 when the Harkway Hills College permit was, was granted, I note there was no further consideration through any external channels and uh, I hope that that would be the case with this particular application. I am uh, pleased to support the recommendations. Thank you, Mr. Boardman. Mr. Belmar, would you like to speak to the motion? Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I note the comments of um, Mr. Boardman. And in supporting this motion, um, I reflect on um, the fact that this is an application that's made in the Greenwich Zone, but I'm mindful that under current planning law, the use of this land for, for education for a school is a permitted use. What that means is that when council faces an application of this type, it is required to consider whether or not the application, the documents, the plans, and the proposed use of the land are in compliance with the tests that are applied for a permitted use um, in the Greenwich Zone. Um, I have carefully considered the documents. I've carefully considered um, the objections. Um, I've considered um, importantly, the fact that there's a requirement for a master plan, that this is um, the start of a development on this site and any future development will require that it be done in compliance with the master plan and that that master plan is one which needs to be presented to council and which um, council is required to be satisfied with that master plan when, it's, if it, when it comes as part of this application. So um, I am careful in also considering um, the objections and the nature of the objections and the matters that are properly taken into account in making a decision about a planning permit. Um, I want to be on the record that the issues to do with the faith of the organisation is not a relevant planning issue. Um, I also want to be clear on the record about the fact that, as Mr Boardman has identified, there are ways that a planning permit can be issued to be clear about the use that can be given to the site. Um, council, through its notice of decision, is ensuring, is letting the community know that um, this notice of decision is clear about the fact that the use of the um, of the land, the use of the buildings, um, is to be use that is related to the school. It's got to be incidental to the school. Um, and I just want to make one last point, and that is that um, what council um, will be doing by mo moving this motion, and myself and Mr Boardman um, are in favour of the motion, is that it will result in the issue of a notice of decision. Now, that will look like a planning permit but it is in fact a notice of decision. What it tells the community is that these are the conditions under which council is willing to grant a permit. Now, because there have been objections, there is a, another process that can uh, occur um, in another place. But 
the community needs to be clear that this document that is um, that will be on council records as a consequence of this motion is a, a notice of decision. It is not a permit. It gives notice of the conditions under which council would be willing to grant a permit. But because there's been objections, it is it has only the standing of a notice of decision. Um, I commend um, the applicants for the careful way in which they have put together this application in the way that they've answered um, any uh, require, uh, requests for further information that council has had. Um, and finally, I also note that there have been a number of referral authorities which um, have not have um, required only that there be uh, conditions on the notice of decision um, and that um, those conditions form part of this notice of decision. So for all of those reasons, um, I commend the motion. Thank you, Mr. Belmar, and thank you, Mr. Boardman. Uh, before I put this to the motion to the vote, I do want to make a few comments myself and confirm uh, for our listening audience this afternoon that all of the objections have been circulated to the panel. Um, I can uh, state categorically that I have read all of the objections and I concur with the appraisal of those objections that have been provided by both Mr Boardman quite extensively and, and uh, Mr Belmar. Um, I think it is important uh, to note that whilst there are local policies in place that allow us to consider a number of matters, the overriding uh, zoning and use is quite clear and uh, I don't need to say more. I think that's been most eloquently explained by Mr Boardman in his moving speech. Um, I think I appreciate that uh, residents have raised concerns around a number of matters and I think the recommendations in the attachment, the conditions that have been referenced are detailed and extensive and they do aim to address the uh, range and variety of objections that have been made that are tangible issues in terms of the use. So I certainly encourage people to look at the attachment to the report, which is the conditions for this arrangement. And I do note the opportunity of appeal that's been referenced by both Mr Boardman and Mr Belmar. So I'll put the motion to the vote, all in favour. Carried unanimously, thank you. And we have item 5.7, which is amendment C236 to the Casey Planning Scheme, ATS Linsell Boulevard, Cranbourne East. Do I have a mover for the recommendation? Yes, I'll, I move that. Thanks, Mr. Belmar. And a seconder, Mr. Boardman. Mr. Belmar, would you like to speak to the motion? Yes, as um, will be apparent from the recommendation that um, is being placed onto the screen if it's not there already. Yes. Um, this is quite an extensive recommendation um, and I will um, explain my reasons for supporting it. Um, and that is because what um, this recommendation refers to is that um, Planning Amendment C36 is a, is a combined proponent-led planning scheme amendment, which includes both a planning scheme amendment and a planning permit application. Um, and the number of that planning permit application is visible on the screen. What this um, amendment seeks to do is a number of things. It's to rezone a portion of land, um, which is zoned floodway zone, um, and to, to the general residential zone. Um, and Melbourne Water has determined that the land is no longer required for the purpose of a floodway. Secondly, to remove the land subject to inundation overlay from the land which has been filled to above the 1 in 100 year flood level, and that is also supported by Melbourne Water, and that the planning, the application of the planning permit seeks approval for a stage 67 multi-lot residential subdivision and the creation of restrictions on the same land being the stage of the Brindley estate. Now, what has occurred is um, the, recommendation, the recommendation that I'm moving this evening is a, um, has been arrived at by careful review and consultation between council, the proponent and appropriate referral authorities to arrive at an outcome um, which means that each party is satisfied with 
um, the amendment being adopted and secondly with a planning permit being granted. Now because this is a planning scheme amendment um, what council is doing tonight um, is moving um, by adopting this motion is referring these matters to um, the Minister for Planning. So um, th that is the next step in this process um, but I am satisfied in reviewing the documents that careful work has been done and again I um, commend the council for the careful way in which it has been able to arrive at a positive outcome for all the parties and to ensure that um, a, a process that began in 2018 um, can be um, finalised um, in a way that ensures that um, submissions, in this case objections, submissions have been dealt with, they've been addressed and an appropriate outcome and an appropriate planning outcome has been arrived at. And so for all those reasons, I commend the motion. Thank you, Mr. Belmar. Mr. Boardman, do you have anything you would like to add to this item? Uh, I, I don't think I could um, add anything. I think it's a terrible injustice that we're only speaking on this particular um, recommendation for a number of minutes, considering there's over 180 pages of information. Um, but it, it does go to the issue of how comprehensive and considered um, council officers have been in trying to deal with objections and to ensure that there's been equity in the representation from uh, those that have been affected by the, the amendment um, and that we have developed a uh, an outcome which addresses those concerns and, and is uh, at this stage um, through, through uh, the positive response to the engagement process um, agreeable and amenable to, to all parties concerned. So as Mr Belmar has, has, has articulated the aspects of the scheme amendment, I am happy to second the resolution. Thank you, Mr Boardman. And I too support the recommendation. I'll put that motion to the vote. All in favour? Carried. Now, 5.8, uh, Mr Belmar, you have declared a conflict of interest. I have. With respect to this matter. So we'll allow you to state your conflict and leave the meeting. Yes, I have I declared a conflict um, a potential indirect conflict of interest pursuant to section 78 of the Local Government Act. I've given notice of that um, of that belief I've formed under section 79 in writing to the Chief Executive Officer uh, and for that reason I will now leave the meeting uh, and only rejoin once this motion has been dealt with. Thank you Mr Belmar. Or I should say at the invitation of the Chair once this motion has been dealt with. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you Mr Belmar. Thank you. I'll just wait for Mr. Belmar to leave the meeting. Thank you. So, item 5.8 extension of contract for street sweeping. Do I have a mover, Mr. Boardman, and seconder myself? Would you like to make any comments on, on this report in supporting the motion? Uh, I think we, we also note that Mr. Belmar did um, um, include us on his declaration and uh, we, we, we've noted that and that the, the process has been managed more than um, appropriately. Um, this is a very straightforward recommendation to um, extend Metro Urban Management's contract, which was first granted in November 2017, for a further two years at a cost to council of $1.3 million per annum. Uh, that would take the total contract up to five years to the end of 20th November of 2022. Um, there's been review of the um, performance of Metro Urban Management. Um, there has been uh, positivity from the community and other clients and stakeholders around the consistency of their service, their responsiveness, and certainly the value to um, to council from the contract overall um, has uh, given justification to the extension of the contract. Um, and after considering all of the aspects and um, ensuring that um, due diligence and process has been followed. Um, I'm, I'm pleased to support that extension and uh, in turn support the recommendation. Thank you, Mr Boardman. I, I too support the extension of the contract and, and my only comment is this is one of the very many council services that's often overlooked by members of the community. It's very important for those who uh, appreciate the street sweeping, but it's also an environmental service in ensuring that uh, we're able to collect things before they end up in drains and, and in our bay and in our oceans. So um, it is a much loved service, I know, by many, many in our community. 
and one of the many things that's obviously supported by our rates. So I'll put that motion to the vote. All in favour? Carried. Thank you. And could I ask you, Ms McLeod, to allow Mr Belmar to rejoin the meeting and we will wait for him to do that. And Mr. Belmar, you've rejoined us. I have. And you can put your video on, please. Thank you. And we'll move to item 5.9, which is the contract acceptance and sealing contract. And this is in respect of the Elliston Family and Community Centre. So do I have a mover for this report? Yes, I move that. Thank you, Mr. Belmar. And seconded? Mr. Boardman, Mr. Belmar, just let you know we've only got your photo, not your live video. So uh, just need to reset in re entering the meeting if you are able to. Yes, I will do. It. Oh, I thought I'd. It's not we showing. have you now. Thank you. We have you back. So that's great. So I'll invite you to speak to item 5.9. Uh, yes. If, uh, the chair permits me, I just need to get to that item in my papers. And just to add to your finding things on the computer, we've lost your image again. So I don't know if it's a connection issue or a setting issue. Um, it might be a, a connection issue, uh, Chair, because I... Uh, That's fine. Please continue and speak to item 5.9. Can you... You can see me now? Yes, we have you back. Excellent. Um, item 5.9 uh, is a, uh, I move this motion and it is a, um, I, I do so uh, very happily because this is a motion um, and work that shows that the case community continues to grow. Um, the proposal is for the uh, development um, of an educational facility and a facility um, aimed at uh, children in the community, um, a number of uh, a tender has been uh, has been advertised and an appropriate uh, contractor has been identified. Um, I am satisfied on reviewing the documents that the tender process has been fair and transparent and that each tenderer had an equal opportunity to tender for the work. And um, as is set out um, on screen, uh, um, the name of the, of the successful um, party. Um, um, they have been successful in accordance with uh, Council's tendering process, and for those reasons, I commend the motion. Thank you, Mr. Belmar. Mr. Boardman, would you like to speak to the motion? Uh, only to to echo Mr. Belmar's sentiments. I, I will make some um, comments uh, in the next agenda item regarding uh, tenders in in uh, in general, and uh, and also um, the successful recipient of the contract. But uh, I, I second the motion. Okay, we'll put the motion to the vote. All in favour? Carried and move to item 5.10, which is contract acceptance and sealing. And this is for the construction of two additional recreation reserve facilities. So um, I believe Mr. Boardman, you are going to move this motion. Right, Thank I you. Will. And a seconder, Mr. Belmar. So Mr. Boardman, please go ahead. So we are, we are awarding a contract on recreational facilities um, as it relates to Tully Allen, uh, uh, active open space reserve um, and in uh, one of the conditions is the issuing of a cultural heritage management plan um, and also looking at um, uh, aspects in the capital works budget um, as we have previously discussed. Um, a um, uh, interesting outcome of this particular tender was the recommendation to Lloyd Group Proprietary Limited as per the resolution on the screen who was also the um, recommended tenderer uh, for the item in 5.9. Uh, this is uh, for two recreational uh, reserve facilities, include incorporating playing fields, uh, sporting pavilions, computing rooms, access roads, car parking, sports lighting, public lighting, and trees and landscaping. Um, it becomes critical at uh, this particular time that we continue our maintenance of sporting and recreational facilities because they are providing not just an essential community um, 
uh, facility considering some of the restrictions that we're all faced with. Um, but once we do get into listening of COVID restrictions and we can resume competitive sport and other uh, group type activities, we want to ensure that we've got the best infrastructure and facilities in place to allow that to uh, recommence seamlessly. Um, this is uh, yet another example of um, the commitment that Casey has to improving ongoingly our, our processes and, uh, uh, and our facilities. And uh, like Mr. Belmar with the previous agenda item, I'm satisfied that the tender has been handled appropriately and that uh, Lloyd Group is a worthy recipient of the contract and wish them well with um, the delivery of uh, their obligations under the contract. Thank you, Mr. Boardman. Mr. Belmar? Um, I have uh, nothing further to add on, on, on this item and I uh, commend the successful, uh, or congratulate the successful party in being awarded the tender. Thank you. Um, I'll just make a comment here and that is the amount of work that has continued in spite of uh, the pandemic, the adjustment of council offices in having to work remotely and uh, tender projects for significant amounts of money and continue the work um, of the council. So all of these things go in, in the background and the community see, see a report and uh, I, I do appreciate the amount of work that sits behind this and all the other uh, continued capital works that we have witnessed over the past months. So I'll put the motion to the vote. All in favour? Carried? Unanimously. And our last report this evening is item 5.11, which is the footpath trading policy amendment. And we have a recommendation. Do I have a mover? Yes, I'll move that. Mr Belmar and a seconder, Mr Boardman. Mr Belmar, I invite you to speak to the motion. Yes, this is an, imp an important um, amendment that is being made to Council's footpath trading policy. It is part of the uh, response to COVID. Uh, presently, uh, the footpath trading policy requires mm -hmm. that, that um, businesses that um, trade and have a permit can only trade immediately outside their premises. The intention of this amendment is to ensure that, um, as is uh, foreseen with a return to a new uh, COVID normal, that there will be a requirement for more outdoor eating space and more outdoor eating areas. And what Council is doing through this amendment is to respond to that and to ensure that um, dining establishments will be able to apply to Council to be able to use footpaths uh, broader than the frontage of their property and also potentially other Council space to continue to offer their, their food offerings. Um, and for those reasons, um, I um, commend the motion. Thank you, Mr. Belmar. Mr. Boardman. Thank you, Chair. Uh, it has to be noted um, in this particular agenda item that um, businesses that are affected um, by this this um, this amendment, um, those that can't train the hospitality and um, uh, and, and and other type of uh, licensed premises venues um, uh, are having some significant and and enormous challenges. Um, and what um, we are doing, in addition to broadening the policy to allow greater flexibility with the outdoor dining space, so that that once restrictions are lessened, that these businesses can, as best as possible, get on some degree of a normal footing and operational. Um, environment as, as possible is we are applying for 500,000, which is the maximum we can under the Local Council Outdoor Eating and Entertainment Package Program, which is the state government's $29.5 million program. And those funds will be used to provide a net benefit so there will be no further license or other fees applicable to such hospitality businesses um, in applying for uh, any exemptions or any approvals for outdoor dining consistent with the state government's policies. Um, to ensure that we are not providing any additional cost imposts or, or, or hardship um, or inconvenience on, on these businesses. Um, I also note that the Economic Development Department within the municipality is proactively working with affected businesses to try and not only assist them with some of the regulatory aspects that they are confronted with to ensure that they can get to an operating environment as quickly as possible. Um, but to also look at greater flexibility that it doesn't just uh, look at footpaths that might be immediately in front or adjacent to 
the premises themselves, but where we do have uh, either council land or, or or shared land such as car parks or, or other type of of land that that might have some use in in this type of um, environment. Um, we know that that the phased approach is still going to cause some significant hardship and difficulty in an operating sense to a number of businesses, and I certainly acknowledge large licensed premises in that regard and any flexibility that we can apply in that regard through either uh, changes to operating permits or so forth, we will certainly work as best as we can to do so. Um, but the intent of, of getting this particular amendment through as quickly as possible is to ensure that as an organisation we are giving the right level of support, encouragement and facilitation of these businesses so they can commence re-operating as quickly as possible. And that is absolutely essential, not only from an employment and economic um, continuity perspective, but also from an amenity and recreational facility. I think that's fair to say, Chair, that we are, all, are missing our human interactions with our friends and families and to have uh, facilities open as quickly as possible where that can take place and our work colleagues for that matter um, will be a very positive thing. And from, from Casey to utilise some of the larger retail precincts to some of the strip shopping centres to and, and other hospitality type of areas um, to make this as seamless and as quick as possible. That's that's what we want to do as a municipality. So I'm very pleased that this has come as an urgent agenda item that we are obviously um, unanimous in our support for it um, and that it goes one step to, to not only providing ongoing assistance, um, but to ensuring that this is as seamless and, uh, and as, as a quick implementation as possible to get these businesses back up and running. So I'm pleased to second and support the re recommendations. Thank you, Mr. Boardman. Mr. Belmar? Uh, oh, you've spoken. I beg your pardon. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I'll put the motion to the vote. All in favour? Carried. That's all the officer reports we had this afternoon. Um, item six is a consideration of reports of committees and we note the record of discussion as listed in the agenda papers. Item seven, we have uh, petitions and we do have one petition for the council meeting. Are you going to bring that up on the screen? So the petition is uh, Restore Places of Worship listing on the City of Casey website submitted by Mr. Philip Kayser. And we have a recommendation, which is that the relevant department head writes to the signatory and provides a response to the matters raised in the petition. Do I have a mover for that recommendation? Thank you, Mr. Boardman. Seconded, Mr. Belmar. And I'll put the motion to the vote. All in favour? Carried. Item eight, urgent business. There is none for this afternoon's meeting. And we move to item nine, which is the closed council meeting. We have one matter, which is a planning matter. And it is recommended that we move into confidential. So can I have a recommendation agreeing to move into closed council? Yes, I'll move that. Thank you, Mr. Belmar. Seconded. Mr. Boardman, all in favour? Carried. So thank you to those of you who have been listening this afternoon. Um, it, we certainly appreciate those that do come and listen to the council meeting. And it's been quite a, a meaty afternoon with lots of items of importance to the Casey community. So thank you for joining us. So I declare the meeting closed and uh, the council will move into confidential. Thank you and good afternoon.